everybody, welcome. If you're not familiar with me, my name is Abby Steele and today we're going to have a session thinking about the phonics screen in check. Um, lovely to see a couple of you here live. I know lots of you will be watching the recording later on. Uh, we have a, a chat option down the side of the screen, which hopefully you can see. You can put questions in at any point. And if you're watching this later as a recording, you can put questions in there and I will come back and I will check and see if you've got any questions that you want me to talk about. So bear with me, let me share my screen. There we are, hopefully you can now see my slides. If not, do let me know. And let's get my chat box ready. There we go. Um, you might notice in the chat box, I have put quite near the beginning of the chat, some download links. These are links to the phonics screening check analysis charts that you'll see later on in the presentation, and also a link to the PowerPoint slide deck. So if you want to download it and use it to cascade training in your setting, or you want to take any slides from that, you're very welcome to. You can just click on those links and download. So phonics screening check. The plan for the session, we're going to remind ourselves of the purpose of the phonics screen and check. I know looking down the list of names, a lot of you, I recognize the names, and I know a lot of you are experienced in your role, you know exactly what you're doing. But just in case there are people who watch this who are new to teaching in year one or new to leading phonics and supporting colleagues with the phonics screening check, we'll just have a little bit of a go back to basics, but not too much. Then we're going to look at the official guidance. There's stacks of information all over the internet about the phonics screen and check, um, but I do tend to recommend that we go back to the original guidance to get our sort of steer on what's what. Uh, so we'll have a little look at that. And uh, there's a couple of interesting points that come out of that actually, um, which I'll get onto in a little bit. Then we're going to have a look at an analysis of past word coverage. So we'll look at all of the words presented in some charts and you can see what came up when. And we're going to link it to Rocket Phonics. So you can see at what point in Rocket Phonics teaching do we cover the code, for example, that is needed for those words. And then we'll finish off with some top tips. And it won't be all the top tips in the world. You might have additional top tips. And by all means, feel free to put things in the chat that others can see that might help them, things that you found useful when getting ready for the phonics screening check. So what is the phonics screening check? It is a quick and easy word reading assessment to see if a child knows an age appropriate amount of the alphabetic code, that is the letter sound correspondences, and that they can decode, they can blend words. So I really like the phonics screen and check in principle. There are some issues with it, but I do like it in principle because it's nice just to have a kind of checkpoint of seeing how the, are the children where we would want them to be at this point in their learning. Um, by using a combination of real but obscure, so 40 to 60% of the real words are supposed to be words that the children aren't familiar with, along with pseudo words, so not real words, the check aims to present children with new or cold words to read, thus eliminating any vocabulary or existing word knowledge bias. So they're aiming to, as far as possible, level the playing field. So there's no advantages more for one or another students. Why have it? Uh, the reason it's quite important to have it, to know whether the children are at the national age related standard for phonics knowledge and decoding. Imagine if we didn't have it, um, you'd work in your own bubbles, you might discuss with your colleagues or schools in your trust, but you wouldn't necessarily know how children are faring nationally. So it's nice to have a bit of a, an idea about that. And actually it's important sort of for reasons that are beyond just in our own schools at a national level to support discussions about good practice because at a national level, we can identify, or the Department for Education can identify, for example, that one particular geographical region isn't doing very well in the phonics screening check. And they can identify that another region is doing really very well. And they can look at, well, why is that? They can analyze what's going on, what good practice is going on in one particular area, or is it to do with the demographic of, of students that we're working with? But it gives us a bit of insight into that information. To identify children who require further support in this area, I know that you already know which children require further support in this area, um, but that's the sort of official line is to support you in schools of knowing which children still need to access more phonics 
they're not quite there yet for that level of decoding and to facilitate an analysis of government spending. So over the last, gosh, 20 odd years, the government has plowed millions and millions and millions of pounds into phonics, saying that phonics is the way to go for teaching. We should all have these programs and these credible books and training. And if they're going to put all that public spending into this area, they need to see some sort of results for that. They need to know that it was the right decision because actually they've helped to improve the standard for children across the country. So that's our why we have it. Um, now let's have a look at then at the official guidance and I'm quite all down for when we when we have a chat together, I'll give you the summary first, so I don't drag that out to the end. So my key takeaway from talking about the official guidance is it's always important to read through that guidance and ensure your year one staff are familiar with it. I see so many questions about the phonics screening check in forums online where actually you could just read the guidance and it is all laid out for you in the guidance. Admittedly, there are some things that are woolly and we will tackle a couple of those things today, um, but it's useful to read the guidance and also the guidance changes over time. So there are various things, just things like, for example, that in previous years, um, it could only be the teacher that administered the check. And now it can be teaching assistants or HLTAs, so long as they have experience of teaching phonics and they are trained in phonics, then they can do it as well. So things like that might change over time. Um, so like I say, always important to go back to that guidance, but actually, it's more important to keep your wits about you and not get your knickers in a twist. Isn't this the case for everything? There's always things that are open to interpretation, um, could be seen in different ways. And so I think an element of common sense must prevail. More about that in a moment. So official guidance, well, which documents do I recommend? The administration guidance. So each year we've got our statutory guidance administration guidance which which gives you kind of the lowdown on everything it's also quite useful to look at the assessment framework actually especially if you're particularly interested so if you are a phonics leader or you're just really interested in this area i find it very interesting to look at that assessment framework for the development of the check and it just gives you all the information about the boundaries and the criteria that are applied when the words are generated for the check and sort of the formula that they use for that, um, which makes it makes sense when you read it, it's, it's a good read. And then past materials, of course, past materials, you can't beat just digging out the old stuff and using sort of words and referencing on that. And part of our analysis is that I've brought some of that together so that we can have a look at the words sort of side by side. So a few key points that come out of this document, we're not going to go through it in lots of detail at all. There's a lot of stuff in there about the nuts and bolts, you know, keep your papers locked away, don't talk about it, all that kind of malarkey. But there are some key points that I just want to highlight because these are things I see come up online, people asking questions about. Pupils who should not take the check. And last year I supported a school and we had a really challenging year one cohort um, well, we had a really high amount of pupils with very complex needs, mainstream school, but honestly, there were about a third of this class, it was about 10 pupils out of 30 that had very complex needs. And so we really had to work as a team, uh, myself, the phonics leader, the year one teacher, and then we brought the head teacher on the discussions about analyzing each one of those children, really, really think about what was best for them and what feasibly they might achieve in a phonics screening check to decide whether we felt they should be put in for that check or actually that they shouldn't be put in, they should, they should not be put in for the check. So you need to have evidence and a clear rationale if you're thinking that you have pupils that shouldn't take the check. Um, and we're talking children that have complex needs that are creating a barrier for them. So they're not recognizing graphene phoneme correspondences, for example, they're certainly not blending. We still want to be really, really ambitious about this. So we still, of course, are teaching them phonics or of course teaching them that knowledge and skills. And we're going right up until close to the time before we make our decision because we're you know, really hopeful for them that we might be able to get them there. But actually there comes a point where you have to be realistic. So you can present your evidence the head teacher must make the final decision on that. That is absolutely, you have to get their agreement, their say so, it's their decision. That would then need to be explained to parents, obviously very sensitively. 
Um, and you need to have a clear plan for what the phonics teaching will look like for those pupils. So we're in no way saying phonics isn't working, we're going to do something else. We're saying these pupils are working on a pathway that isn't this regular pathway. They're not there yet. So actually, this is what their phonics provision looks like for them. Um, and you might consider, and this is what we did with the school that I was working with, providing a similar experience as the phonics screening check. So the year one teacher created uh, an adapted version where they used section A um, and some slightly simpler words. She put together an assessment so that those children would feel included, they would be included in the process of having this phonics screening check but it would be at a level that was accessible for them and gave them a level of success and results they could share with the parents and you know praise the things that they were achieving. 6.1, checking your administrator or your check administrator, sorry. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this has changed over time. It did used to be that it had to be the teacher, but now it can be a member of staff trained in phonics who is known to the pupil. It's administered one-to-one. -one. They need to be able to use their professional judgment to score responses. And this is quite a biggie, actually. This is the one where, I mean, I hope in everything in phonics, we're always upskilling and empowering all of our staff to learn about phonics, learn about children, gather that experience, listen to sessions like this, and then have that confidence to ap apply their professional judgment because that's why we're in teaching. We have that ability to apply that professional judgment. So I really want us to empower all of our staff with that um, when it comes to scoring responses. We don't want people feeling anxious or worrying about whether they should or shouldn't mark it right or wrong. And we'll get to a bit more on that later. Um, they should have experience in delivering phonic sessions to children. I think that really helps with the making professional judgments if they're used to working with children in this way. And it mustn't be a relative carer or guardian of the pupil taking the check. 6.2 preparing rooms makes sense, a quiet, comfortable, well-lit space, remove or cover displays if they might help pupils, and avoid disruptions, distractions, anything that might aid them. If you're having to share a space, for example, think about is that gonna actually be a bit of a distraction or a disruption? Um, we need to get the balance right of taking it really quite seriously. Um, and I've seen terrible practices going on of people, you know, doing naughty things with the with the check because there's a lot of pressure on people feel a lot of pressure to get, you know, certain results. Um, but also these kids are five and six. This is just a phonics screening check. We just want to know, do they know their code and can they blend the words? This is not, you know, their A-level exams. So we just, again, need to apply common sense to all of these things. 6.3 access arrangements. Um, there's a lot of guidance in the administration guidance, the official document about how you can make adaptations to the materials and they provide some adaptations for you anyway. You don't need to seek permission to make those adaptations. If you would like support, you can actually contact them and ask them if you're not sure about something. But again, common sense and knowledge of the pupils needs. Um, so things like taking a rest break. If they need a rest break, fine, but ideally the pupil is kept separate from the class and they complete the session on the same day. Um, using things like cued speech, visual phonics, sound buttons, changing the font, changing the size of the font, having fewer words on the page, colored overlays, having color, black and white. There are things you can do to make it more accessible to your learners. Uh, I would just think about having a rationale for why you're doing those things. Um, but yeah, that, that's good to see that there's a lot of flexibility there. A little note on sound buttons, um, particularly because we are thinking about rocket phonics primarily. So sound buttons are not part of the main rocket phonics approach. You'll know if you use rocket phonics, sound buttons are not in there. They're not in the program. And this is because they're not necessary for most children. And I found previously when I've observed phonics practice using sound buttons, they can be overused and unhelpful. People end up using sound buttons and they're not quite sure why they're using them or why they're still using them after a long period of time. Or I've seen children applying them and the children are all applying them wrong and not being picked up. Wrong. So it can be an added layer of complication. It's just not very helpful. However, in rocket phonics, we aren't prescriptive. We aren't, um, 
dictatorial to you is that you know we don't tell you what you must and mustn't do we aren't fierce like that we guide you we give you this is the way it is this is, way it is. This is our opinion um but we don't say don't use them so if sound buttons are something that you in your school like to use as a strategy then they can be a useful strategy to support children who find it difficult to identify digraphs within a within word which is a very specific difficulty for some children for a short period so by all means you can have that as a strategy in your school many of you already will do that um, and you should be spotting those children early, the children who are, you know, when you start to teach digraphs, who's really struggling to like, recognize those in a word. And then you can introduce the strategy if you think it will help them. And then if it's something that some of those students are using at the time of doing the phonics screening check, then you can use that in the phonics screening check if you think that will be a support for them. So another thing in the official guidance is the script. And I think it's great. I think it's really useful to have a script. I would tweak it ever so slightly. And, and my message here is really useful to have a script, share it with your staff, but also know that it's absolutely fine. And I would encourage you to tweak it to make it your own or make it flow better. In this activity, I'm going to ask you to read some words aloud. You may have seen some of the words before and others will be new to you. You should try to read each word, but don't worry if you can't. If it helps you, you may sound out the letters before trying to say the word. And I would maybe use language they're familiar with, like um, sound out and blend, or remember to decode the word, the type of words that you would use when describing that in a lesson. This practice sheet shows you what the words will look like. Have a go at reading these four words aloud. You should have come across them before, in, at, beg and some. Well, I wouldn't have expected children to necessarily have come across beg and some. And when you see words and they're very much out of context, so they're not in a sentence, they're not, you know, in the body of a lesson, um, sometimes it can be the most common regular word and we're a bit thrown by it or children are a bit thrown by it. So I probably wouldn't say you should have come across them before. I might say you might recognise some of these words or you might, you might have come across these words before. The words on this side are not real words. They are names for types of imaginary creatures. If you want to use the word aliens in your school, use the word aliens. Um, often official guidance will avoid things like aliens because aliens can be culturally inappropriate in some contexts. So they try to make it just much more generic. So imaginary creatures, reading out the words in this booklet and I'm going to write down what you say on my sheet. And for that bit as well, just have a little think about what feels comfortable. Would you, you know, I might say something like, um, oh, I'm going to be making a few notes on, on my page. I, I want to try and avoid the children feeling like, oh, I've got to read out the words and I can't see what you're writing, but you're writing things down about me. Children are really switched on and savvy. I want them to feel as comfortable as possible. So I would try to make that really natural and say maybe something along the lines of, um, uh, right, are you ready then? You're going to start reading out the words in the booklet and I'm just going to be making a couple of notes on my bit of paper, um, just something to kind of downplay that almost. Let them know that I'm making notes, but downplay it. In this booklet, there are four words on each page or you might have arranged the um, assessment in a different way for access. You might have individual word cards or whatever you've done with it. I will tell you at the start of each page whether they are real words that you may have seen before or names for types of imaginary creatures. I don't think that I would need to tell my children that at the top of each page, especially if they've got pictures next to the creature words. So I might say something like, um, I will remind you when we turn to each page whether they are real words or whether they are the creature words. Again, something that just sort of downplays a little bit because I just don't think it's necessary to keep explaining it when it's really obvious on the page. Right then, this first page has the names for types of imaginary creatures or aliens, and you can see their pictures. Can you start reading the words to me? It's important to tell the pupil whether they're real words or types of imaginary creatures on each page. And that's the point I just made. I don't think it necessarily is. Depends on the pupil um, whether you need to give them that little reminder or not.
which leads us to 7.1 assistance so you have to try and get this balance right of being really supportive but not giving too much help for them so you can point to words but you're not allowed to slide your finger left to right and you're not allowed to hover your, your finger over the letters but you can point to them to kind of to focus their eye about right this word next during the practice bit you can remind to blend words so there's a top tip when you do that practice bit i would absolutely be giving lots of reminders about now remember what we do if we get stuck on a word we sound it out and blend it don't try to guess don't try to just tell me the whole word i'm not going to be impressed by that i really would love to hear you saying the sounds and blending the word because of course, sometimes we get in the screen are children who've become really quite able readers and they want to impress you. This is a little reading assessment and they'll look at the word with a glance and it's what we do as a mature adult reader. We look at the word with a glance and we chuck out the word and hope for the best. So you might look at a word that looks like thang is an example I, I use often. So the word is thang, T-H-A-N-G and a child looks and says thing. They say, oh, thing. Um, so actually, those often those very able readers need a reminder, do not guess, do not throw me the word that you think it is. I'd really much rather hear you sound out and blend the words so I know that you're reading exactly what you can see on that piece of paper. So during the practice, I would really go heavy with that because when you do the actual assessment, you can't remind them to do that. Do not indicate if correct or incorrect, but do offer encouragement. And another top tip and a, a reminder, and I, you know, if you're not the year one teacher administering, then please pass this on to whoever's administering, that the importance of that offering encouragement. And you might even want to do a little bit of role play if you have staff that are new to role about how to kind of um, keep children motivated by fantastic efforts. Oh, I love hearing you read these words brilliant next one fantastic move it along so you can give praise without saying yes it's right or no that's not right um and remind your face remind your face not to give it away as to whether they've got something right or wrong and remind your hand when you're making notes not to give it away because some children will be very sensitive to oh they they want that feedback of am i doing it right you know can you tell me anyway so do offer encouragement you need to make the judgment about how long to pause on a word and when to move to the next word and you are absolutely allowed to stop if a pupil is distressed or significantly struggling that's a judgment call you're not going to stop because you want to give them the best answer and there might be a few more words that they can do that are coming up but if that pupil is showing any signs of distress that is the last thing that we want to have um, and if they're struggling so much that it just it's a miserable situation you know they're not accessing it you know that actually then just stop it's not worth their distress 7.4 scoring the check so this is where it gets a little bit more interesting and a little bit ambiguous and a little bit we need to rely on our common sense um yes okay so scoring the check um there is the official guidance expands on this more there's a guidance video with a script it gives lots of lots of examples it's worth watching but those examples generally are, if the child sounds out the phonemes, but they don't actually blend the word together, incorrect. Real words need correct pronunciations, but pseudo words may have alternative pronunciations. And I flagged that with some little stars because we're gonna talk about that in a bit more depth on the next slide. Uh, we can't use any bias for accent, even if it's not a pupil's usual accent so if um your pupil normally talks in an accent like i've got and says bath but actually they read the word as bath you can still accept that even though they use the wrong that not their normal accent it's still a regional accent you know acceptable pronunciation if a child has some speech difficulties and um uh they struggle for example with pronouncing things like instead of saying the sound they say so I don't like bath. Let's take the example bath. If bath, they go b a f, and then it comes out as bath with a f sound. But you know that child struggles to articulate that sound. You can accept that. You know that child. You know that they they mean the right sound. They just struggle to pronounce it. We don't have discrimination based on speech difficulties. Uh, pupils can self-correct without prompt. So you can't say to them, 
Ooh, have another try or, mm, do you think that's right? You're not allowed to do that. But if they have a go and they kind of pause and then self-correct, fantastic. But you have to accept the final answer so it works the other way. If they blend it correctly and then they second guess themselves and they pause and they then blend it incorrectly and kind of indicate that that's their final answer, you have to accept that one too. So watch the guidance video. It's quite old now, but it's quite good for giving lots of examples. However, it has led to uh, a complication. Now, lots of you might already be aware about this, but I have a little bit of a kind of like the latest update on it. So the official guidance says, pseudo words may have alternative pronunciations. And here's the exact wording. You can allow alternative pronunciations of graphemes in pseudo words. The scoring guidance gives some alternative pronunciations, but the list of acceptable pronunciations is not exhaustive. So if children give you a different sound for that grapheme, but it's a plausible one, you can accept it. Or so you may think from that piece of guidance. And I've always believed that. I've always said, well, that's the guidance. I take that at face value. It's not exhaustive. The list of examples of alternatives give you the most obvious alter alternative. You know, it gives you the obvious what we're looking for. And it's usually that it is, it's the most instinctive. It's the pronunciation that comes to you first. Um, but because it's not exhaustive, if somebody gave me something different, I can accept it. But the guidance is foggy, so it makes it seem as if alternative pronunciations are acceptable. However, the video script shows that alternative pronunciations that are not plausible and regular are not acceptable. Now, plausible and regular, I don't think that's very good wording to use. What they mean is if it's viable in the English la language, the way that the words are constructed, that you would get those graphemes and those sounds next to each other, then you can have it. But actually it's even, it's even stickier than that. So the example they have, the word is veed. V-E-D, with the E sound spelt E-A. So although alternative pronunciations of digraphs are allowed in non-words, this child uses the, and this is not helpful because in the guidance they use the international phonetic alphabet, so they use the symbol. So sometimes you have to look up, well, what, what sound is that symbol? So this E and I together is representing the A sound. So the child uses A, so they say vade, v-a-d, vade. And the guidance is saying, that's not a plausible, regular pronunciation for the EA digraph. Um, and then oh, on, the, on the, the next example, they just said ah, they said v -ah -d vad, and no, that, that's not a plausible explanation. But phonics experts, so me and actually a lot of other program writers, so within the, the list of 45 validated phonics programs, there are a large amount of us that are in a kind of group together. And we all talk and we all collaborate and we all support one another. And there's a large amount of us that say, hang on a minute, this isn't right. And one lady, Leslie Clark, has been sort of battling this for years, actually, with the um, STA standing tested, testing people. Anyway, um, because imagine that the pupil has just learned about, they've just had a lesson about the EA grapheme as the A sound. So they've learned about steak and great and break. We've just been talking about that in class. So what can happen is if children have just been learning about that, or they've just been learning about, say, for example, long digraph sound, long vowel sounds, then they go and apply that because it's fresh in their mind or they're trying to be clever. So then they might come up with vade. It's unreasonable to expect that the Czech administrators, so you, the teachers, and the pupils to know, well, which alternatives would be plausible and which alternatives would not be plausible. How do we know that? Would you know that EA cannot be A in that particular word? And it's to do with that it follows the V or that the D comes next, that there are no other words in the English language that have that particular spelling combination. 
But then actually, how can anyone know the pronunciation if a word is not real? If we're saying it's not real, it's made up anyway, how can anyone know? So my advice is don't overthink it. Use your common sense. Um, I 100% would be devil's advocate. I would use my judgment to accept an alternative pronunciation if I thought it was plausible in the terms of why the child had come up with that. I'm not going to analyse the word construct or know off the top of my head whether that is or isn't plausible. Um, so I would accept it. I would give that a yes and the official guidance would give that a no. So considering many publishers and teachers make up nonsense words with, in effect, illegal spellings, it's totally unreasonable to be pedantic about this. Now, in Rocket Phonics materials, we use actually um, in our uh, mock phonics screening checks, we use the words that come from the official phonics screening check papers. So there's an element of knowing that they are the correct formula but actually there are so many materials on the market and teachers create their own nonsense all the time that technically you wouldn't ever have in the screening check because we don't have those combinations of letters and sounds in the english language and so they wouldn't be plausible and regular in terms of what they're saying here but that's just not reasonable for us to to deal with that um if the child knows a feasible pronunciation for the sounds and can blend them into a word, then so be it. We are testing code knowledge and decoding, not advanced knowledge of word construction and English spellings. And I will happily take responsibility for giving that guidance. And that is something that we are pursuing officially with the um, STA. Um, I'm going to read you the example that Leslie Clark got back from the STA yesterday. So this was all going on yesterday when I was supposed to be delivering the session the first time live. So Leslie said, I've had a response from STA. This is like, this is like we're pals and we're having a bit of a goss, isn't it? It's good. I've had a response from STA about whether or not marking a child saying spoke for the word splock, S-P-L-O-K, would be acceptable as an alternative pronunciation for the O? And the answer is no. Most people in here, which is our kind of WhatsApp group for a lot of phonics providers, thought it should be acceptable with what a five-year-old knows and understands about phonics. And she'd also done a Twitter poll or an X poll. 50% of schools would allow it according to online polls. I think we all need to push for this information to be made clear to schools as the existing guidance is being interpreted in different ways, which is making marking totally inconsistent. This is their email, would love to hear your thoughts. So this is what the STA said. When pupils decode pseudo words, alternative pronunciations are acceptable if they are plausible. Regarding the word splock and similarly splot, S-P-L-O-T, the long vowel sound for the grapheme O is used when a word contains only a single vowel which comes at the end of a single syllable word as in go and no. Both these are year one common exception words and should be taught as such. Alternatively, it may be used with words ending in consonant I've missed a bit there. I've cut a bit off. But anyway, similarly for splet, hang on. Is it come up if I click on it? Oh, yeah. Alternatively, it may be used with words ending in consonant digraphs or strings, e.g., cold or bold. Similarly, for splet, S P L E T, the long vowel sound for the grapheme E is only used when a word contains only a single vowel, which comes at the end of a single syllable word, as in be, me, he, she. All of these are common exception words and should be taught as such. The long vowel sounds would therefore not be plausible within splock and splot and splet. The applying domain within the year one phonics screening check assessment framework describes the application of knowledge 
to a range of phonically decodable words in order to be able to read fluently. Children should have confidence in blending using appropriate pronunciations of the phonemes for the given context. The framework also states that they should be able to pass the sequence of letters to generate the correct sequence of phonemes, which they then blend into the correct word or pseudo word. Um, quite frankly, what a load of tosh. And um, welcome, a couple of teachers I've just seen have just uh, <laughs> joined us now. What a point to come in at. My mind spins. What an absolute load of rubbish. And actually, I did start to do it over the last couple of days, but I didn't have enough time to apply to it. I bet you I could find um, exam um, uh, exceptions. I bet I could find exceptions. I bet I could find words in the English language where those phonemes would work. So we need to not overthink it, you know, take it at face value, but it's fascinating to know, isn't it, that officially the guidance says we would not accept for example those long vowel sounds um we have to take it as the short vowel sound. but who's going to know that the teachers are not going to know that the children are anyway i digress please know that in the background that argument is going on and we're all sort of battling to kind of work on it so moving on we've done the official guidance now let's move on and look at um some actual analysis what do the children need to know and do to do well in the phonics screening check. They need knowledge of the alphabetic code as per the framework. And in those official guidance documents, there is actually a chart that shows you all of the possible letter sounds that could occur in the phonics screening check. And it's really not actually that many. Um, so knowledge of the alphabetic code, they need to be able to blend words but of course, when we think about children learning to, to decode, learning to blend, there are humps to get over, aren't there? There's the initial hump of just being able to blend like a CVC word. That's a big moment. Oh my gosh, they can blend, they can blend a CVC word, wonderful. And, the, and they tend to go, the progress tends to go in fits and starts. So it feels like they're never gonna get there. And then suddenly they get that bit and it's incredible. Then another hump, and it's not for all children. Some children are really smooth with this kind of development, but other children find it harder. Another hump is the consonant clusters and blends. So words like flat and milk, where you've got those two consonant sounds together. Um, some children can find that really difficult. Others not. Split digraphs. Some children trip over split digraphs because split digraphs tend to be taught more towards the phonics screening check. We cover them quite early in Rocket Phonics, sort of if you're on the regular pathway, end of reception, you start to introduce them. Um, but for some children, split digraphs can be a bit of a hump as a harder thing to remember. And then you've got this distinct feature in the phonics screening check, which are these consonant strings. So you'll see on the chart in a minute, you've got these C, 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 V, C words. You've got words like strike and scraps, where you've got the S, T, R, and the S, and that can be really hard for some children and their vocabulary and I've put some stars by that because vocabulary should not be a feature of the phonics screening check the whole point of the phonics screening check is that we level the playing field with these pseudo words uh, nonsense words and some obscure real words children should not be advantaged by knowing the vocabulary I have a little bit of a problem with that um, and here it is so here are some words that have cropped up on the phonics screening check over the years. Model, delay, label, tailor, second, blossom, trapeze, sequins, whirling, concrete. How easy or how difficult is it to read these real words and get the correct pronunciation if you don't know that word, if you don't know that vocabulary, if that word is not in your spoken oral vocabulary, are you gonna get the correct pronunciation for those words? Some of those words require a tweak. So a word like model, you can actually sound it with m, o, d, e, l. Even though we teach l, the schwa l, later in phonics, sort of you might mention it in uh, year one when you do l, e, certainly in year two you'll be talking about that you can actually access that from much earlier mm, or de, eh, ul, model model oh a tweak model you can tweak it and modify it so if you had a child 
um, working at really low level, so pink level reading in phonics in reception, but they've got an incredible vocabulary, they in theory could get that word. Um, but you'd have to know the vocabulary. Delay, d e l a, delay, delay. It's like a schwa, isn't it? Delay. Same with label. Same with Taylor. Same with second. Same with blossom. Uh, sequins, s e q i n s. Sequins doesn't sound right. Oh, I need to try a long vowel sound. Sequins. Only if you know the word sequins or you've heard the word sequins, and that long vowel for the e letter e yes in theory children should know that from reception because you do he we me be she so you've introduced the concept that that of that and you might talk about it again um in blue level it's summer term two in reception or you might sort of have moved that to year one if you if you're working on a different pathway but you'd be talking about that again when you're looking at e alternatives but there aren't a huge bank of words spelled with that long e vowel and so we don't have that as a discrete teaching lesson so that might feel quite obscure so that's that's hard for children to get um whirling the phonics is quite straightforward but that's a bit of a tongue twister if you don't have the word whirling automatically as the vocabulary and concrete same again you might get thrown by that and trapeze you might get thrown by that split digraph e because there aren't tons of words with that and it's quite unusual vocabulary so I think that's a bit stinky and a bit unfair to have words like that in the phonics screening check. Now, if we're being positive about it, because I try really hard not to be a negative Nelly and not to criticize and, you know, because to see the silver linings and things, it's a way of seeing your greater depth word readers. So it really does distinguish the children who score 40s against the children who are getting 35, 36. So they're, they've met that benchmark. They can do the decoding. They've got the phonics knowledge but they're just lacking that X factor. They're not quite that great a depth to be able to have natural vocabulary, that natural reading, that ability to tweak words. Um, but like I say, the check should only be about decoding. So that's a little bit naughty. That's a little acknowledgement from me there of, yeah, that's that stinks, doesn't it? Um, okay, moving swiftly on because time is romping away. Let's do some analysis and mapping against Rocket Phonics. Like I said at the beginning of the session, in the chat box, there are download links. You can have these charts. You can then tweak them, play around with them, add to them over time if you would like to. Um, something I find helpful is that in Rocket Phonics, we tend to think in terms of time blocks. So we've got our year, and then we think about it as these half termly six week blocks. It helps us to kind of organize what are we teaching in that block? You know, what are we covering? And it enables us to shift things around. So for example, you might be a school that just started with Rocket Phonics, or you might be a school that has um, a cohort that's a really struggling cohort and you might have shunted the program so that actually the reception summer term content you might have bumped that up until year one ideally not ideally you know you keep up and follow the program as it is but it, it enables you to move things around and get your head around things so we think in terms of these half termly blocks but we also think in terms of the color progression pink yellow red blue green orange and these are um, traditional, the book banding colours, uh, but a more modern version where we align it with the phonics. And this helps us link our teaching to reading books. But just a reminder, you can be teaching in one colour block. You could be teaching now blue letter sounds, but actually their independent reading might be at a previous colour block. So your teaching might be at blue. Those are the letter sounds you're working on. In a supported context in the class, they're accessing blue text but actually in their book bag for home reading, they're accessing maybe yellow, maybe even red. So it's possible to go and across kind of across the sort of skills. And that's quite also useful when looking at this screening check analysis, thinking about we've got the phonics knowledge required for the words, but we've also got this, the decoding skill, that increasing decoding skill that are required for the words. So here we go, first little chart, this shows us the words that are in section A of the phonics screening check from 2012 to 2023. Um, and of course there, there wasn't a check in 2020 and 2021 because of the COVID times. Um, and this color coding is showing you in terms of when the letter sounds are taught, when those bits of phonics code are introduced, this is the sort of the time that it 
that it happens in. This is the sort of, you know, alignment. So actually, if you have learners who pick up their code quite well and they are able to blend well, so um, a lot of children, we aim to have them blending by Christmas in reception. That's quite a good barometer of, come on, guys, you know, it's we're going into January. We really need to be blending some words. So if children are kind of on that trajectory for progress, all of section A of the phonics screening check is theoretically accessible by the end of the reception year. And um, I'm a devil for uh, the phonics screening check to me is just so not a big deal. It's just literally you're just reading some words the same as you'll be doing in class all the time anyway and I'm frequently wanting to check in on how my children are doing so it's just not a big deal to me or the children I would do some of this with my reception children at the end of the year just to have a nice barometer of where we're at you get an early insight into what they might be struggling with or um, how well they're doing so there we go so that's uh, reassuring to see and reassuring to see if you have children who are working behind. So perhaps you've got children who are in year one or even year two, perhaps, and perhaps they're working on a different pathway. So they're working through the phonics much more slowly or they're revisiting. They need much more support. Their progress is slower. It's useful to see that actually, you know, you can be this far through the program and be accessing the phonics screening check. So that's that one. Now, the next chart is the same information, but the colors are going to change because on this chart, we've shown it according to just thinking about the letter sounds. But actually, realistically, there are lots of words there that flag up as pink because the phonics is low level, but really we would not expect the children to be blending those until into the red level and we wouldn't put those words so words like stop trap crab tram blot flat plug words with those consonant blends or clusters we wouldn't put those in a pink reading book only very very rarely if we desperately needed a word like stop to you know hold the whole story but we would um with our leveling we would put consonant clusters and blends into red um not into pink so really although the phonics is pink the reading level we would deem as red so next slide which is the same information but you'll see a lot of those pink boxes now jump to red boxes there we go so this is when the word structures are typically used in rocket phonics um, constant blends used at red level and not pink level so that's quite useful to see um, if you have children who are confidently reading at a red level phonics book or a yellow level phonics book, you can see how much of this they should be able to access. You can sort of tie that in. Okay, next chart is going to show um, section B. So phonics screening check section B, again, shown across all those years, 2012 up to 2023. Um, now we've added in down the side where that teaching typically occurs in the rocket phonics program so you can see which sounds are cropping up that would be taught within those green blocks year one autumn two spring one spring two and occasionally we've had examples that have come from summer one that's soft c so we had rice twice and saucers and it was pretty unfortunate that in one year it occurred it occurred as two words in the same in the same test so those can crop up they haven't for all of those other years but they can crop up um you can notice that the interesting yellow rows that go across at the top you've got scrap scram splat scrap scram straw spray strip spree scrap a clear pattern there with those strings and again, down in the nonsense words, strom, splot, strad, sprop, splam, scrug, scrid, stret, spran, splet. Again, those letter strings are a really dominant feature um, that occur there. So uh, anything else you want to talk about there? We've talked about the thing that crops up about that, you know, if they give you a long vowel sound, if they give you a short vowel sound, that officially the guidance would argue that you shouldn't be accepting 
for example, the long vowel sound because it's not uh, feasible in that combination of word. Although I'm absolutely hell bent determined to find some exceptions that are to kind of prove the point to them that they shouldn't be saying that to us. Um, but again, you just have to apply apply common sense um, and things like so in 2023, um, the bottom right hand corner you've got drave and you've got strave and in the guidance they expect those words to be read as drave and strave but imagine you've literally just read a book with a child and been talking about the word have and if they say drav and strav oh that's it's it's plausible they've just been doing the that actually i know it looks like a split diagraph a but in some words like have it doesn't work like that so imagine you've just had that lesson and then you know those words crop up i wouldn't penalize them for it i would use my judgment of the child actually if i felt that the child was getting it wrong because they just you know didn't know but if i felt that it was plausible according to what was been going on then i would still mark it for them and that's going on across the country people with different understanding of that and different marking so there you've got that second chart um there's a couple that i've put pink there because technically technically you know, children can access those at about pink, pink C with phonics. Model, obviously, they'd have to know the vocabulary and they'd have to be able to tweak it to get that all. Um, but m od e l model, model. It's like things like jacket, j a k e t, jacket, jacket. We say jacket, we tweak that pronunciation, but you can get there with much lower phonics. Um, so a fair sort of mix across the the later colours there. Not much from from orange. A splattering at green. So really, you want well. The next charts will show you. There's some charts that we're going to put up now, and these charts present the same information in a different way. So let's have a look at that. So these charts are presenting all of the words that come from the phonics screening checks. You can see that across the columns at the top there. But this time we've matched it against the week by week teaching in rocket phonics and so that's just quite in useful to see the the spread the variety when things are cropping up um there are things in there so for example we talked about the word structures so the word structure of um stin for example we've got in week three the word stin we wouldn't expect children to be able to blend the st independently then but actually there's nothing to stop us from modeling that to them, from making the children aware of that from earlier on. And actually, if you get hung up on word structures, if you get so hung up that you think, no, 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 we must do letter sounds first, and then we must do uh, vowel consonant, what you know, at um, or in, and then we must do CVC words, and we mustn't do what, what used to be letters and sounds phase four, mustn't do phase four until they're ready, mustn't do phase four until the end of reception, actually you're doing yourselves a disservice because delaying that exposure to those consonant clusters and blends causes some children to get really, really good at blending with things like CVC words, and then when you hit them with a consonant cluster and blend, that's a big mountain to climb. Whereas if you've been exposing them to that experience from right at the very beginning, then it can make that progression much smoother. It, it avoids having a problem there. So I would recommend exposing the children to some of that. So this kind of chart is quite useful for seeing just how the words are spread according to the phonics. It might be useful for you thinking about if you put some word packs together, if you make any resources that you might use some of this as part of your sort of packs for phonics screening check practice or play-based packs that you use. So here we've got um, the spring term of reception if you're on the main pathway. So this shows the kind of spread of words there. Quite a nice idea that actually you've just got a few words each week. So you might say, for example, right, week 21 with A and E, A, I and the double E. Obviously you've got your regular teaching anyway, but you might go, right, actually, we're gonna go across this row, take these words and make a little pack with them. So queeb, waiting, bame, cheek, veen, freed, main, clain, queet, hint, queen, keeps, reef, greet, braits, veens, braint, peel, sweep, trails, wave, spree, deebs, craint. It's quite nice that that pack, that chunk of words has got those particular pieces of code sort of grouped together. 
And then this is interesting. So this is kind of what I was saying before about the amount of phonics. If you've got that ability to decode, the amount of phonics you need to be able to do well in the phonics screening check, this is the summer term of reception. And this is showing a learner who can blend, including consonant clusters and two syllable words, needs the code knowledge from Rocket Phonics Big Book 3 or Pupil Practice Booklet 3. So the reception content of Rocket Phonics to achieve around a pass mark of 32 plus in the phonics screening check. So if you have, if you started the program behind schedule, if you went earlier, you went back or you have a group of children that have gone back and started earlier, you can still cover what you need to cover to pass by just reaching this point. Uh, have put a couple of little asterisks and next to words like tailor and sequence. We've discussed those that Again, it's the vocabulary that might throw things off there. But you can see, you can get scores there of 34, 35, 36, um, but certainly 32 just on reception content. And that's year on year. So that's quite reassuring, interesting to know. Moving now into year one, this is the autumn term from year one, the two half terms from autumn. So big book four, pupil booklet four. And this is showing us that actually if by the time you have your phonics screening check, so June, 10th of June, 13th of June, wherever it falls each year, if you've only covered this much of the program of Rocket Phonics, they can be scoring 40 or thereabouts. So a learner who can blend, including consonant clusters and two-syllable words, needs the code knowledge up to Rocket Phonics Big Book 4, People Practice Booklet 4, to achieve 35 to 40 marks in the phonics screening check. And you can see there we get 39, 40, 40, 38, 39, 38, 38, 37, 40, 40. So quite often, the vast majority of the phonics screening check sits below this point in Rocket Phonics. That gives you some flexibility. I mean, obviously, I hope that you all have cohorts um, of children where actually you can follow the program as it is intended and you can achieve very highly and you're going way beyond the phonics screening check that's your bench the phonics screening check is is lower you know your children are surpassing that they're getting much deeper and broader knowledge but i just think this is so reassuring for if you have a challenging cohort or if you have a challenging group of pupils you can play around with your pace through the program, you can repeat a term, you can pause, and you'll still cover what you need to cover. Um, and then this is just showing, going into spring from year one, those few words that crop up occasionally going into there. But, but even if that happens, if you follow the main pathway, you'll still have always covered what you need to cover. Or you can calculate where you're up to and whether you maybe need to bring, if you're working behind, do you need to do some lessons from week 19 a bit earlier to get in that bit of content before the screening check? So top tips to finish off with, and thank you for bearing with me. Um, every session I do, don't I? If you come to my sessions, I'm always like, I worry how I'm going to make it last longer than 20 minutes. And at an hour, I'm like, oh, I'm not finished. I've still got a few more minutes. So anyway, top tips and not exhaustive. There's loads of top tips, but just a few things that come to my mind. Really important to ensure that your staff feel confident about the administration. So hold a training session if appropriate. You know, get together and go through that guidance document. Go through this PowerPoint with people and pull out those key points because you can't make assumptions about colleagues as confidence or awareness. It's, I'm terrible for doing this because I'm so steeped in the world of phonics and because I've been doing this for years and years and years, I forget what it's like to be new to phonics or new to a year group. So if you're new to year one, there's a lot to get your head around just in terms of teaching year one children. Very quickly, you'll get that experience up, but there's, there's you know a lot to get your head around. Um, but actually we mustn't make assumptions that our year one teachers are fine. Oh, they're fine. Oh, they're doing really well. They might not feel confident. They might need a bit of support with making those judgments and what to do. So check in on them, work with them, but don't leave it too late. Get in there early with these conversations. Talk about each individual pupil rather than groups. So if I'm supporting you as a consultant or if I was your phonics leader in school, I'm going to say to you, right, let's have a look at your year one children. Show me your data. I would like to see a mock screening check from point A, maybe October or December. I would like to see a mock phonics screening check from the next checkpoint. So maybe after Christmas or January, February. 
I would like us to have a discussion about how those children are doing, what prog what progress have they had a big rate of progress so they might be still struggling and getting a low score but they've made masses of progress since their first you know want to talk about that on an individual level so by all means group them but then i want to know about harry about sarah um about harjit i want to know those individual details about what's going on with them their struggles what they can and can't do what you think about them share information with parents of course um send home practice materials so cards or lists or the i can blend lists in rocket phonics those are even when children are blending it's important you know they're reading books to still have those word lists can really support them with word blending um have plenty of phonics screen chat play packs children love to play teachers so in your continuous provision from year reception onwards you could make packs of cards um, or practice sheets that become play materials for them to just have a go and just practice blending with don't ever be shy away from modeling more complex word structures earlier. We mentioned that waiting can cause a barrier. By all means, use sound buttons if you want as a support strategy. There should be no surprises. You should have a clear view on how children are progressing from early in year reception all the way along. So we should not be reaching this point in the year and then going, oh my goodness, we're panicking about the year ones. You know, that shouldn't be a surprise. Um, children can make remarkable progress in a short space of time, so be ambitious about that progress. So if you have children now, you're looking at your data going, oh my gosh, these children are not scoring well on their mock phonics screen check, like, ah, is it too late? What can we do? Actually, with some real push and some real focus, they can make incredible progress. Sometimes it's one of those humps they need to get over and then they can leap forwards with it. Now, this is interesting. Pumping the practice isn't falsifying the results. I used to feel a bit skeptical about this idea of um, drilling, drilling for the test. I don't agree with drilling for the test, you know, prepping for the test, focusing everything on the phonics screening check. I don't agree with that. However, if you're practicing for the test, you're pumping, you're drilling by doing loads of blending practice, there's nothing wrong with loads of blending practice. And often that's exactly what the children need. They need a big boost. They need a big boost of loads of blending practice. So long as you remember that getting that benchmark score of 32 can be like a cliff edge. So they can get 32, but those of you that are experienced in this will know that doesn't mean they're a secure reader. They've taken a jump forward with their word decoding but there are all sorts of other reading skills and reading maturity that may not be there yet. Their phonic spelling may have taken a hit on their writing because you focused on reading. So it, it's a little bit false in terms of, oh my gosh, they're doing so well, they've reached this point. Actually, we need to go back a bit and then we need to carry on with our plod, 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 teach. It just gave them a good boost. So so it's not drilling, it's not false, it's boosting, giving a, a needed boost but we know we need to do a lot more work after that phonics screening check as well. Maximize little and often opportunities always. How can we squeeze in more chances to practice blending some words? If children have specific issues, so, oh, this child keeps missing the first sound off. So they say the sounds, and when they blend the word, they always miss the first sound off, or they always miss the last sound off, or they always guess the word. The answer to all of those specific issues is more practice needed more blending practice, more, more, more. There isn't some deep complicated thing going on there that you need to overanalyze. Of course, you know, check for sensible things like do they have any hearing issues? Is it to do with any speech difficulties? But I'm telling you guys like a hundred percent of the time, they just need more practice, more modeling, more practice, more support, more practice of blending. Adjust your teaching if you need to. The Rocket Phonics regular pattern is blending and segmenting days alternated. That's the regular plod, plod, plod pattern, our smooth and consistent way of balancing all of the skills. But if you feel like you want to focus on blending every day in the run up to the screen, then do that. That's absolutely fine. You can do that in addition. You can have an extra blending session or forego your segmenting days for a few weeks, a couple of months just come back to it afterwards. Look at what your summer term is going to look like after the phonics screening check and how you might need to then focus on some segmenting to kind of even up those skills again. 
task. You might need to adjust your teaching to reflect the cohort. What you do this year might look totally different next year. You can pause your teaching. You can repeat a term. You can make these professional decisions around your pace and progression to support the needs of your children right now. Then just come back to it later. Get back on the path. Think about the balance of skills. Think about slow and steady, plod, plod, plod. Think about the long, the long game to get children there. Definitely use mock or past papers. You want to compare them through the year to see the progress. It's really, really useful. So do do that. Um, don't let it kind of fall by the wayside because you've got really busy. Do be wary of materials with illegal spellings. Uh, use your common sense. No one knows your children better than you. Model lots, loads of modeling, 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 how we blend, but be wary of too much modeling. If you model too much, so you're always blending the word first and asking children to blend the word afterwards, they're not blending, they're just repeating you. <clears throat> and if you use too much modeling and you don't have a big enough variety of words, a big bank of words, they will end up learning those words as whole sight words. So that's not gonna do you any favors when the phonics screening check comes out with new cold words. So you need a really big cycle of words which is you know why it's quite a nice idea to do something like use some of those charts of the grouping the words according to the sound and spreading them out and add to it over time um, but use a big bank of words to prevent whole word memorizing and then it was just a final mention there is an information leaflet for parents so if you don't have anything at the moment and you want something there's a really nice in with the official guidance you can get an information for parents leaflet that you can use and that was all my points. So I'm just gonna come now, I can see something in the um, Q and A. Ooh, uh, I seem to have disappeared. Anyone else the same? Oh gosh. Uh, well, if I did disappear, if there were any problems, uh, huge apologies. Hopefully the recording has been absolutely fine. You'll be able to watch it later on and maybe it was just a connection issue. I will watch the recording back. I'll put it on fast because I hate watching myself, but I will watch it to check for quality issues. If there's any problems with the recording, we can always redo the session. That's absolutely fine. And by all means, reach out to me if you have any questions, e email, or like I say, put them in the chat because I do come back and check. Um, and then we can, you know, connect and talk about these things. If there's anything you want to talk about, also let me know um, whether you want like a, a, a quick session, um, whether you want a quick session after the 24 phonics reading, do you want to have like a debrief? Do you want to get together and talk about, let's unpick what words there were and have a little conf lab, not like a long session like this, but whether this kind of thing is useful. Um, and also I'm interested to know, are you in need for your school of things like a PowerPoint for parents? I haven't created any of that stuff. Um, in Rocket Phonics, we've kind of, we've been so busy creating the actual product that we haven't created a lot of things like parent support. So by all means, let me know. My diary is starting to clear now. So if you want some things creating to support you with Rocket Phonics pictures and all sort of my sort of spin on things, then let me know and we'll get that added on the list. Anyway, I must let you go. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I hope it was useful and interesting. Fabulous to see all the names on the list. Hope you're well uh, and I will see you sometime soon. Bye.